Welcome to the ATG webinar, Furniture Layouts Using Generative Design in Revit. Uh, I'm going to be your host for uh, the presentation today. My name is Jeff Kuhn. I'm an AEC Technical Specialist here at ATG. Uh, today's presentation, I'll have a, a brief uh, overview of today's content, and then we'll have a, a live demo followed by a Q&A session uh, at the end. Um, after the closeout for today's webinar, you will be directed to a three question poll. I would very much appreciate your response to these questions. Uh, there's just three short questions, so it should take, you know, just a small amount of your time. Uh, please, we do uh, request that you, you fill these out uh, uh, for, that, for that feedback for us. Today's webinar is a live recording, so you can uh, follow us uh, on LinkedIn or our YouTube channel. And so please feel free uh, to re review any of the, the content from today's webinar uh, at your leisure. And then also, because this is a, a live uh, presentation, we do have uh, questions within the chat window. So please be sure to uh, address any questions you may have, and we'll be sure to follow those up at the conclusion of this presentation. Um, if you do want to revisit at any time, you know, you can uh, connect to the YouTube channel. Uh, probably the easiest way would be just through a Google search to type in ATG USA YouTube, uh, and you'll find uh, all of our, our webinar and uh, live content uh, from our, our, our YouTube site. So if you're like me or most designers, it can be very time consuming and somewhat overwhelming to produce several different design iterations uh, for furniture layouts to present to clients. Thankfully, with the power of Dynamo and generative design in Revit, uh, Revit has developed a process to quickly generate design alternatives based on your specific goals, constraints, and inputs and then you get to explore and optimize and make informed decisions that best address those design problems. So what is generative design? Well, gender design is a design exploration process between humans and computers. Designers, engineers, input design goals into the degenerative design software, along with parameters such as performance or spatial requirements or materials, maybe some manufacturing methods and even cost constraints. The software then explores all the possible permutations of a solution it then quickly generates design alternatives that can then be tested and learned from those iterations for the best that works and what doesn't. So for example, it may take several hours for a designer to, or a design team to produce maybe three or four different furniture layout options for a particular space. With Gender Design, <clears throat> the software can compute dozens to hundreds of different layouts based on the criteria, constraints, and inputs produced by the design team. And instead of taking several hours to develop these options, generative design does it within a matter of minutes. So our learning objectives for today are to utilize the different types of placement methods uh, that are built into kind of the out of box standard generative design processes. Uh, those include the, the grid object placement, so this is a sample study that generates alternative options for placing objects in a room using a rectangular grid. We'll utilize the random object placement. So this sample study generates alternatives randomly uh, placing those objects in a defined space such as trees or uh, in a park or people in a building. And then we'll take a look at the stepped grid object placement. Uh, this sample study generates alternative options for placing objects in a room using a stepped or grid uh, pattern. So with that, let's go into our live demo. 
So here within the uh, Revit application, you know, before we get into processing sort of our, these generative design studies, we kind of have to take a little time up front to uh, really kind of set up the scene, especially for the type of study that we're trying to develop here. So in this case, we have a, a cafeteria area here, and we want to maybe take a look at um, some table and chair uh, seating arrangements uh, within this cafeteria room. So we've got the space laid out. We've got our room placed in here. Uh, we've got, of course, our exterior walls. We've got some openings. Uh, we have some column locations uh, set up within this particular space. Uh, and we also have over here to the side, a couple of uh, families for different sizes of tables and chair configurations uh, within those families. So once that's been kind of pre-set up, we simply go into the, the management tab and then within the general design section here, we click on the create study command. And then a little window dialog will pop up. And here is where we get to choose particular study types from different samples or some study types that uh, your organization or individuals uh, may have developed uh, on their own. For this example, we're just going to use the, the out of the box uh, auto samples, which would include the grid, grid object placement, the randomized object placement, and then this, the stepped grid object placement. So let's start with our grid object placement uh, case study here. And we'll go ahead and just select the command and it'll process here for a moment. And then you'll get a, a new window dialog bus kind of giving you a, a brief description of, of what this uh, general design study will entail. Uh, a simple URL uh, to, to preview and get a little bit more in-depth uh, knowledge of how this was developed. Um, first of all, we need to give this study a name. So in this example, we'll just say, and it, it will automatically give you a, a, a sample name to, to, to choose from. Um, and we could just utilize that as our, our grid name for this particular study type. And then under method, we have some options here from the pull down menu. Um, I can do a, a randomized study. So I could generate design options by randomly assigning a, a value to each of these inputs. Uh, we could space them evenly. So they'll be spaced evenly within that, that grid layout. Uh, we can run what's called an optimized process. So it runs multiple generations of iterations that improve based on prior results. Or we can also apply what's called uh, like this. So this applies small variations to the set of selected uh, variables. Uh, in this case, for this example, we're going to choose the, the space evenly uh, method. And then we get a series of inputs that we have to apply to this study to determine what are our, our end goals here for this particular uh, placement of these objects within this space. And we have a couple of options to choose from as far as inputs goes. Uh, we, can, we can set the distance between the objects in the X position. We can then set the distance between the objects in the Y position. And then we can also minimize the distance from the objects to walls. So, if we selected each of the inputs individually, uh, I get a little sliding scale or bar here that I can determine the position or constraint within that position in the Y direction. Uh, in this case, we may just want to say, we'll leave it at the uh, constraint of two and make sure that we select that to uh, input that value. Uh, same thing with the Y position. So we may want to just make some a few adjustments here. And we'll just say two again for that distance. And then we get a constraint between 0.5 and 2 for our objects to wall distances. In this case, I might want to actually maximize this constraint uh, based off of the uh, distances from our objects to the wall. The reason being is because of the, the column locations 
shown here within the space uh, aren't necessarily included in our inputs here. So we'll go ahead and make sure that's selected. So then we have to select a family type to include in this study. So simply select the command here, and then we will go over and we'll just simply select our uh, round table with four chairs. And then we need to select the room in which we want to place these objects within. So we'll go ahead and select the, the room for the cafeteria. Now in this, uh, uh, defined study, the total number of outcomes is already predetermined for us. So we'll get a total of eight outcomes. Um, also, we don't have any, if you, if there are any issues within the inputs or the selections, uh, those issues would then show up here under the, uh, the issues bar. So simply all we have to do now is generate our outcomes. So Rub it with the power of Dynamo and the general design process will go through and begin to process eight different studies based off of the inputs that we placed within those criteria. Okay. So from now you can see we've got the, the eight of eight studies developed here and within our chart we can start to click to see and get some detailed information based off of those inputs and what those outputs are and we can see the different iterations of those studies here under the filters area we can begin to filter depending upon certain uh, inputs that we want to deem as being more viable for this particular study. So I could simply say the number of objects here, maybe I only want them to be between 40 and 20. So if I filter between those two, two numbered areas, you'll see now it'll filter out uh, the different case studies based on that criteria. We may say the object area outside of the room needs to be between 25 and 20. And as we filter in each of these different options, you can see our options or uh, studies um, become uh, filtered based off of those uh, criteria that we, we deem important for this particular case study. can clear the filters here and we'll say, let's say for example, we wanna choose option number six. We can say the number of objects is 44. We can see that uh, object areas overlap, you know, about 57.04. I'm, I'm assuming those are probably inches. Uh, we can make the adjustments, we can see the adjustments in the X and Y direction and some of the variable information here as well. Um, then once we've decided that for this particular space, this option seems to be the most viable for our defined goals, we can then just simply say, create the Revit elements. It'll process it. It'll create those elements. And then you can see here, they're then placed within the space. Now, in this example, of course, depending on maybe some of the criteria we place into the inputs on the overlaps and even into the areas where the walls are, of course, this doesn't really make it a viable choice because the, the room or the tables and chairs overlap each other and we're running into the exterior walls. Um, let's say this one doesn't work. Well, we can simply undo that and rerun a new process. So I can simply create a new study. I can go back to create object placement. 
Let's change some of our distances here. Distance between x and y. Let's max. Let's just go ahead and we're going to maximize all of these here. And maybe we'll minimize that. We'll go ahead and reselect our family and select the room. Oh, we're going to be optimized. We're going to even in space. And we'll generate a study. So now you can see, you can start to simply create all these different studies based off of the, the generative design uh, inputs to quickly start to develop, you know, different furniture layouts based off of those uh, different design criteria. Now, again, this is, may not work because of the overlap on the, the, the furniture atlas, but you can see the power of quickly developing, you know, at least a series of eight different options that you can then to uh, review and refine based off of your design criteria. Now let's say, for example, we want to, on the grid object placement, maybe we don't want to do an, an evenly spaced one. Maybe we want to go with a, a randomized uh, design option. And here we'll just stick with the, the out of the box inputs on this one. Well, Go ahead and select our family and the room to place that one in. And here we have um, some additional options to choose from based off of the, the method that we're choosing within this particular study. So under the randomized method, we can actually change the number of solutions we want to have uh, produced for us. In this case, the number of solutions is uh, set to 40. We'll go ahead and we'll just say we'll set that to 20 and we'll go to generate. And so just like the evenly spaced uh, grid object placement studies, you can see now we can we have some more options based off of the outputs of, of the 20. And we can simply slide and filter based on certain inputs and adjustments we want to make. So here maybe we'll say generate those elements based on those filters. Now you can see we can start to develop multiple types of, of options for our uh, cafeteria seating and table layouts, uh, simply just utilizing uh, the grid, option, grid object placement uh, case study. So now let's say maybe we don't want to we don't want to go with a, a grid object placement. We don't want to be within a particular rectangular or square grid, but we want to be more of a you know stepped or diamond type grid pattern. And that's when we can start to utilize the grid object placement uh, case study here. Uh, very similar to the, the grid option one, uh, the, the inputs based off of the methods, you know, we have our random, even the space and optimized. Let's run the, the optimized one here. Uh, we'll maintain the same uh, out of the box inputs. Uh, this time we're gonna select the, the larger table here and we'll select the cafeteria room. Now here we have some additional 
uh, goals and constraints that we can input into this particular uh, defined study. I can set some goals for this particular uh, series of, of uh, layouts for this particular uh, step grid object placement study. So on the number of objects, I can either define the object place as maximum or minimum. In this case, I'm going to say minimum. I can say the object area overlap can either be set to a minimum or maximum. We'll just leave that as a, as a minimum. Uh, object area outside the room, uh, we, may, we may not need that as a, as a particular goal for this day. So we'll just, we'll just uncheck that one here. And the object area inside the room, we'll leave that as, as maximum. And then any adjustments to the y and x direction uh, based off of any percentages, uh, we'll just leave those as, as minimum. And then we can set some constraints here. So we can set a constraint for the number of objects. We could say maybe our minimum number of objects is 10 um, and our maximum number of objects are 30. Uh, we could say the object area overlap. Uh, we maybe want a minimum of, oh, we'll say five and then maybe a maximum of 10. And area outside of rooms, we won't determine. Maybe we don't need to set any of those kind of constraints here within this particular study. Uh, we can set the population size. So based off of the number of seatings, we can determine our population size and the number of generations we want to uh, generate for this particular uh, defined study. So we'll go ahead and hit generate. And then the computer will then process those And you can see just how quickly the computer begins to generate these case studies for us. Whereas, you know, we may have thrown out, you know, maybe a couple hours worth of uh, iterations to produce basically, you know, maybe two to three options where the, uh, the computer is basically doing the same processes in a much faster time and producing many more um, design options for us that we may or may not have actually uh, come up with. Um, not quite sure why the step to grid one here is only showing one when it should have been 10, but it's probably based off of the inputs that we've determined in our initial study. Let's just say, let's create that one, see what that looks like. And that's probably not a very viable option here. So let's go back and let's redefine. Let's redefine that here. We'll just leave everything as it is. And maybe we won't set any constraints. Looks good. We'll go ahead and hit generate. Now you can see just how quickly the computer starts to develop. Each of these different studies based on those criteria, And as it's processing it, it's looking at the different scenarios based off of that optimization that's built into uh, that particular Dynamo script. So let's say, for example, maybe we want to utilize this one here. Then we can quickly see, you know, all the different options uh, within that set of criteria to 
really choose the best scenario that, that fits within our design goals. Now, we know that some of these may or may not work. In this particular case, we may have too many chairs or tables, especially, you know, you've got one sitting here in front of your, your openings, you got one too close to the corners there. And maybe it's just simply just removing a few, but you can quickly develop multiple different design options uh, simply within a matter of minutes instead of uh, uh, several hours uh, to put together a simple uh, presentation to a, a client to, to see. And even utilizing the general design uh, workflow here to show that like, here's some of the processes in which we came up with on these different goals and criteria to present to those clients uh, so that they can see uh, just how you are, are developing um, those different those different scenarios. Okay. We could even say, let's say with some of the, let's go to a different type of uh, uh, space here. Maybe we've got uh, some of these instruction rooms. We, uh, we want to utilize uh, some desk space for, for students for uh, these instruction classrooms. Now let's look at some of the grid options here. Uh, maybe I want this one to be evenly spaced. Select here, select the room, generate some options for that particular space here. Maybe uh, we want to place a new one here for instruction 314. Maybe we'll set this one to a uh, random method. Number of solutions here. You can quickly see and start to quickly develop different layouts for these spaces just by simply selecting the different families, the rooms, and inputs. Uh, within these different studies. In this case, let's try 40 for this one. But again, as you start to develop these, these different studies, you can you know, start to create uh, different views and different options, design options, uh, based upon uh, these different studies and the different inputs within those studies to really come up with you know, dozens to hundreds of different layouts uh, uh, for these different spaces and the types of furniture that you may want to uh, place within in these rooms. Um, it just gives you a, a much more uh, open um, way of thinking outside the box of just the simple, you know, here's kind of a, you know, a grid system here and here for this particular space. Maybe we just repeat that pattern for every single room, but maybe we want to we want to have another option, and this I think allows you to to give you that. Uh, that other set of options that that you may or may not uh, have that uh, thought process as you're as you're putting these uh, furniture layouts together. 
Now let's talk about the, the random object placement. It's very similar to the, the grid object placement and the stepped object placement um, with a few minor differences as far as what, how we uh, input some of the information into the, the actual study itself. So here we have a, a lounge area on this second floor uh, building here. Um, and we want to just kind of think about, well, maybe we just want to randomly place some uh, different chairs, some tables, uh, and maybe some uh, specialty equipment or whatever, uh, randomly within this, this, this large lounge area. So let's utilize the random object placement and see how that may affect our study based upon these, these inputs uh, within this defined study here. Again, we're going to, since this is our randomized object placement, we'll leave it as random. Um, we're going to go ahead and say, we'll leave everything on the inputs as they are out of the box. Now on the select family type here for placement one, instead of actually selecting an actual family type that may have been placed uh, somewhere here within our, our view space, we're actually going to choose a family type from the selector based off of all the uh, families that are loaded into this particular project. So in this case here, we want to look at some chairs. So let's see here. We maybe want to use the, let's use the brewer chair as our family type one. And then we can choose another family type. So here, maybe we want to look at um, let's see, maybe some let's see if we have any tables here. As to the table lamp. That's just the lamp, let's see. And we'll do the, the night table. Stand here. Uh, select obstruction elements. So here we get to choose different elements within our space that we define as obstructions. So these columns here, we are curtain walls, our interior walls, doors, and some exterior walls as well. And we simply select the finish command. And then I'll select the, the room to define the study in. And then the total number of elements to place uh, based on our variables is between three to 800. And we'll just go ahead and leave the number of solutions at 24. And we'll simply say generate. Now we can see, based upon the different inputs and the family types that we defined in the study, our random placements of those objects within that particular room. And we have essentially 24 different studies uh, to choose from. Just simply selecting and looking at the different areas. In this case, the graphics aren't as clearly visible because of the different constraints, because of the, the wall constraint that we added uh, within that, that input there. Um, and it's usually utilizing a three-dimensional view uh, for the actual details themselves. Uh, we can change the, the sort by view types here. I can change them to a grid or to a, a list view. And let's just go ahead and say, let's go back here. Oops. Yeah, we'll go ahead and choose that one. 
let me say generate or create rather elements. And now you can see that the generative design process is randomly placed our tables and chairs randomly within um, this particular room or lounge space. Now, again, some of these may or may not, depending on the case studies, you know, be viable options, but it gets you at least a quick starting point to really start to develop and think about developing uh, different room configurations uh, or furniture configurations within uh, these particular rooms that you're defining within your project. Let's go back. Let's do another randomized one here. Let's say, let's find an optimized. Let's say, Go chair. Same instructions. Stop the room. Let's change our. Let's go to five. Say next twenty. Objects. So what it did was it still kept the same original objects in from the original study. And so if we are developing multiple studies within that same plan or view, um, if you didn't want to keep those original objects in that space, uh, we would have to remove them. So, but it does keep all of the different studies here. So we can simply just select the ones from the previous studies that we've developed and input them as needed. So you can quickly see how each of those affects the different layouts within those different criteria. So that kind of brings us to the conclusion of our webinar today. Um, please, I'd like to open it up now to any questions and answers. I do have a question here from, from Rob. Uh, I've had some issues with the origin settings and the out of the box general design scripts. It works as expected with the Autodesk sample, but if I try to use our content and our template, it shifts families up and over. 
I believe the setup of the survey to internal origin to project base point is the culprit as well as the family origin point. Any advice on how to edit the script to react appropriately in our environment without changing our default survey project base point? Good question, Rob. And unfortunately, I don't really have an answer to that solution. Now I know under the case studies here, we can edit or view the Dynamo script for that particular study type. But once we get into the Dynamo application, it's a little bit beyond my knowledge and experience and how to adjust uh, the different parameter types and inputs uh, within the actual Dynamo script itself. Here you can see um, once I select the, the edit the Dynamo script, uh, my Dynamo player uh, becomes active and we can see all the different nodes and how those nodes um, are run within that particular script. Um, but in order to define which node would be based off of the origin points or making adjustments to those nodes, um, that's just beyond my, my knowledge base. Now, it's not to say that you can't redefine these Dynamo scripts to either include or exclude certain inputs or elements or nodes uh, within them. And um, if you are a, a, a proficient Dynamo user, um, these sort of simple out-of-the-box scripts um, make it much easier to develop your own um, case studies as utilizing these as kind of a, a base point. Um, you know, I simply would recommend that you would do a file save as, um, just so that if you ever needed to come back to this as a, its original script, uh, you've got that original uh, file uh, that you can utilize um, over and over again. I hope that answers your question. Any other questions or, or comments? All right, if there's nothing else, uh, thank you for attending uh, today's web webinar. Uh, this recording will be posted to the HCG YouTube channel uh, for any future use. Um, and please feel free to peruse all the other uh, webinar and content on our YouTube channel. Um, again, please uh, take the time, fill out the, uh, the brief uh, three question uh, survey at the, the close of the, the seminar here. Um, and again, thank you. Uh, and I'm hoping this was uh, very informative and, and useful uh, in your generative design uh, processes. Thank you. Hey there, thanks for tuning in. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe and check out some of the other content on our channel.